All right, so in this lesson, you're gonna learn about the two technologies that brought us containers. What is a container, you ask? Well, let's first start out with a little bit of history to understand where containers came from, why they got started, and what they're designed to do. I really think that a lot of people skip this step and it's actually really important. And so if you're going to be a part of my learning, you're going to learn everything there is to know about containers. And this goes with the rest of my classes. I try not to leave out any of the even slightly boring information. And really, it's really important to understand where they came from to know where they're going and how to use, utilize them properly. Now, if you were expecting to start using Docker in this lesson, I'm sorry to say that you're going to be disappointed. We won't use Docker readily until the end of lesson two and really, in lesson three. This first lesson, we are going to talk about what containers are, the end, their history, and the technology that backs that history. Now, containers are not just about isolating network compute and storage. It's about it's also about immutable builds and environments. Have you ever heard the phrasing, well, it worked on my machine? This is one of the problems that immutable infrastructure tries to solve. And this is something that containers do an excellent job of working with. A container allows you to wrap all of the dependencies your process needs, so there is no more it worked on my machine, or at least less of it. These containers allow you to wrap all of that environment and package it in one single uh image. A big mistake that I see a lot of people new to containers is reference VMs. I want to be very clear that a container is absolutely not like a VM. And I think it's important to start with the concept that VMs are not the same thing as containers. I have heard many people say something like X container running in Docker, the container does not run in Docker. Docker or any container runtime does not run the containers inside of them. They don't, they're not that type of runtime. The container actually runs on the Linux kernel using Linux kernel tools, and you don't need any Linux kernel plugins. These are natively supported in the Linux kernel. You can actually use the command line and start a Linux container without any of these tools like Docker. So if you don't need Docker, what is the point of Docker? Well, Docker, it makes it very easy and brings it available to the masses. So there's still a point to Docker. It's just that it is not a virtual machine. In so much as it doesn't have its own kernel, it uses the kernel of the host OS. Because like I said, it's running on that kernel and it's just the user space or really just the isolation of a single process. You don't even have to bring an entire user space. What does this mean? It means that every container that runs on your machine uses the same kernel. What you might be asking, how does the Linux kernel do this? And before we jump into C groups and namespaces, I thought I'd give you the history so that C groups and namespaces might actually mean a little bit more to you in this very first lesson. If we really wanna know the history of containers, we have to start way back, way back before I was born. Truth was first introduced in 1979, and Truth let you change the root directory for a given process. So you could change the root directory to whatever you wanted for a given process, making what their root was different from the actual root. This was really helpful for builds, and a lot of build services use this because it allowed you to isolate it from the file system and make sure that you had all the build dependencies giving you a better build dependency uh, allocation. Now, this kind of was the status quo for a while, but in the early 2000s, you got free BSD jails. Free BSD jails even allowed you to sign IP addresses to the jails. And this brought yet another level of the container ecosystem. Then in 2006, just a few years later, 
Google released what was then called process containers. And process containers were a, a feature that designed at limiting the amount that these uh, file systems, amount of resources that these file systems could allocate. And later on in the 2.6.24 kernel, these Linux, these process containers were actually merged into the Linux kernel as C groups or control groups. So this is where control groups comes from was Google's early attempts to make containers. So it's not until 2008 that the first fully fledged containers that required no patching of the Linux kernel became available. And this was LXC containers. LXC stands for Linux containers. And while this is a little bit confusing because all containers run on the Linux kernel, this is Linux kernel. Linux containers are just the name of the initial implementation. So LXC containers and LXC use both C groups, the Google contribution back in 2006, and Linux namespaces to isolate the work group. Now, at this point, there was still a lot that happened. It wasn't until 2011 that Warden was released. And then just two years after that, LF, LF, LMCTFY, which is let me continue containerize that for you, uh, was released just before the release in 2013 of Docker, what we all commonly know and understand as the container runtime. Now, Docker isn't the only way to run containers, and there's an entire ecosystem of container runtimes, and we'll get to those in more advanced classes. But for right now, we're going to focus on Docker. Docker was released in 2013, and what one of the reasons that made it so popular was just the ease of use. Docker is more aptly a suite of tools to manage containers, not a single tool itself. Fast forward to now, and you have a bunch of tools based around the same thing. Let's try to understand how Docker or any Linux container runtime work using these two base tools LXC leveraged back in 2011 to make modern containers a reality. Just a quick clarification, sometimes when I'm talking about containers, I will talk about your process. Containers are used to isolate a running process, and that process is your process. That is what a container's job is. It's to isolate that process. So I want to make sure and be clear if I'm talking about your process, I'm probably talking about the one that you're trying to containerize. Now let's start to understand how these containers are actually done and made. So like I said, there was two main technologies, Linux namespaces and C groups. What are these though? And what do they do to isolate your workload from everything else? So the first one, namespaces, provides isolation to your process. So what I mean by isolation is just that it isolates it. It isolates it in the file system. It isolates it in memory and it isolates it in processes. So namespaces allow you to isolate your process so that it can't see any other processes. It can't see network. So there's network namespaces. And this means that it can't see the network of another namespace. This isolation happens at the Linux kernel. Namespaces, interestingly enough, don't just bring isolation in the grand scheme. Namespaces also bring another bit of functionality that is very helpful when you're talking about containers and is one of the core reasons to use containers. And that's the immutable infrastructure. Now, isolation doesn't actually bring it natively, but it's one of the results of it. Because you're isolated, you have to package the entire file system that you want to use. So if you need to use ls or curl in your script or process that you have packaged, you need to package that in your namespace. And that needs to be available to your container. So if it's not in the file system for your container, then your container cannot use it. And so this is a huge thing that is brought 
because of this. Later on, when we get to building your own image, we'll learn to specify what processes and what things we need to include in your image's file system so that you're able to do this. And we'll find some easy ways to actually do that. For an example, I wanted to show you here, this container was not built with the Vim tool. Meaning if while I'm in this container, I try to use Vim, it will fail. Cool. Vim is installed on my computer. It's just not available in the container. Lots of containers don't even include bash because it's not needed to run the application. And you shouldn't include things that you don't need. Okay, so enough about namespaces. Namespaces bring isolation, and this is a good thing. But what about C groups? What do they bring to the table? If we have isolation already, why do we need another piece of technology? And if you remember, this is the piece of technology that Google brought and was kind of one of the last things that was needed to be included into the Linux kernel before we had fully fledged containers from LXC. Control groups very quickly just allow you to control how many resources a container is allowed to use. So namespaces actually don't allow you to limit based off of resource consumption. So you wouldn't be able to say, limit how much memory a container could access or how much network bandwidth a container could access. This is not provided in the base um, in namespaces. And it's very important when you're talking about scaling and the cloud and things like this to be able to set limits on these containers so that you don't have a bad actor. But not only that, it's important to set uh, limits on these things, even if you're just running them on your local machine so that you can understand and know the limits of your containers. Okay, so this is really cool. We have two core technologies that are utilized to bring us containers. Here is a really quick and overly simple overview of a Linux container. As you can see, all of this is running on the Linux kernel. There is no Docker in this. There is no cryo. This is why if you notice Docker on Windows and Mac run a VM, it's because containers are running on the Linux kernel. Though the Linux kernel features not Docker. Docker is just a tool that makes doing this fast and easy, unlike what you might expect if you were coming from the VM world, where the entire OS is packaged into this image. This is not true for a container. A container is just packaging anything that needs to be in the isolation. So it's just packaging a minimal file system with its isolation that it requires to run its process. Okay, in the next lesson, you can expect to learn more about what OCI stands for and the entire ecosystem of tools that's built around containers.